Die Hard is a really interesting film for me to review. It is a real 80s classic that has aged extremely well. It is beloved by almost everyone and for good reasons. It earned 140 million at the box office, did well in home media, sales and rentals, got a huge fan base, it is well known in popular culture. I mean, every action film nowadays is referred to as Die Hard. No, wait, in the 90s. J just ask an older brother about it and got an 8.3 in IMDb. It has 94% with uh, the audience ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and 92% with critics with the consensus it's many imitators and sequels getting to that. Have never come close to matching the tall trails of the definitive holiday action classic. Yeah, getting to that. Dart later, later. It gets very complimented, but right here you can see that at the time it was praised for its action and special visual effects, which were great, but Dart is also a smart action film with substance, like The Terminator and Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And those films actually got analyzed a lot more over time, but Dart still hasn't really been fully delved deeply into. And as I feel like snickering over that comment, I'm gonna call, follow my new therapist advice and read the Bible to purify myself. Yes, unlike with my last therapist, her thing myself is wrong. Yeah, I know, he's always... And he works for the Catholic Church, so I just wasted my last chance for salvation. Tough luck. The film also cast John McTurman, who already was on the rise because he had directed the highly successful Predator, to become even more successful. Predator had been a huge box office success, and a lot of fans and audiences had loved it, but critics were harsh on it. They said that it had a way too thin plot and too little characterization. Die Hard made them critically successful and caused critics to re-examine Predator, just as Thelma Louise had done for Ridley Scott and Alien and Blade Runner, and Seven had done for David Fincher and Alien 3. And even Aliens and Terminator 2 Judgment Day had done for James Cameron and The Terminator and The Abyss to a smaller degree. John McTurman being the director guaranteed this film would be awesome, as Predator was a fantastic film and he directed that for 20th Century Fox, whom he was also allowed to direct Die Hard for because of that film's success, similar to how Ridley Scott did Blade Runner for 20th Century Fox after Alien. Also, John Silver produced the film, who also produced Predator 1 and 2, and had therefore already collaborated with McDermott and who had produced all four Lethal Weapon films and would produce all three Matrix films. And no, I'm not going to discuss the quality of the sequels of the Matrix films. Or of Lethal Weapon. Or of Predator 2. Or make a tie in here. Except for that I'm like tying and the fact that I'm not tying in. So, is the tying in? You tell me. Because the answer is no, so if you say yes, you're an idiot. Go fuck yourself. You retard. Uh, no, wait, that, that's offensive. You dumbass. No, wait, that's offensive towards dumbass because you're even dumber than that. Um, you stupid fuck. Yeah, yeah, that should do. And ho hold on a moment. I'm apparently getting 500 thumbs down in just one minute. You guys really can't shake a joke. <sighs> and it's also funny the film was based on the sequel novel to The Detective to be a sequel to the film The Detective. When that didn't work, it was to be a sequel to Commando, and when Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't willing to return, it finally became a standalone film. And also, the script was even unfinished when they started shooting, and John McDermott didn't do rehearsals with the actors, having a fast production schedule. It sounds like it's going to be a disaster, but the film was worked out greatly step by step, as John McDermott, like David Fincher, got very involved in writing, and a plot twist worked out, character arcs developed, motivation strengthened, and themes deepened, and even funny witty dialogue added, and Joel Silver got very involved with the writing also, it allowed McDermott to to have the leading hand in the process, as he's a very respectful producer towards directors, but at the same time also very hands-on. Also, John McTurnan, again like David Fincher, is a detailed actor's director, explaining what pronunciation, movement and motivations he wants, and taking enough takes. And he got great stars like Bruce Willis and Alec Ripman. And no, I'm actually not gonna reference Snape anymore. I am slightly getting ahead in terms of majority of my jokes step by step. They are small steps, no doubt. But... They do matter. Yes, anyone can at one point achieve not being as bad as Family Guy. Take a note from it. You can get to the level of South Park season 12. That is still worth something. And he also worked on the score, the special visual effects, direction, set design, lighting and cinematography. He also used very unconventional editing and direction and some assistants rather him out to the studio. And he was almost fired, but unlike someone like Ridley Scott, he held on to his vision. Wait, really after Predator? Because they almost fired him for the same thing on Predator. Yet that film was a huge success. And so they almost did again with Dart, and that film was also a huge success. So I hope they finally learned a lesson. And Jan de Bond was cinematographer, and Michael Kamen, who did the music for all for Lethal Weapon films, became music composer. And John McTurnan also has a really original style, seeking films as operas. Or was it symphonies? I'm too lazy to check. They're basically the same thing anyways. 
And no, I don't care about the music lovers that are offended by this. Go back to your base friends. Just as I'll go back to mine. Cool. So now that I've wasted your time telling you things you could have just learned by listening to the DVD commentary, let me waste your time by telling you why the film is smart, which you would know if you were just a little sophisticated. Which you are not. And in fact, you're also too lazy to listen to the DVD commentary. So I'm not wasting your time, you're wasting mine. Go fuck yourselves. There it really is a thinker's action film, is Little Jimmy 835, set of Alien, in this fantastic series of reviews of what happened to the Alien and Bread series, one of the greatest strengths of this film is its pacing. The film doesn't immediately dive into the fighting, but first takes its time to establish the story, setting, characters and mood of the film. The film establishes that there is a Christmas party in the Nakatomi Plaza and that John McClane has come to visit his wife who works there. And John McClane is an experienced policeman who has dealt with criminals before, and Hans Kruger and his henchmen, however, take out the guards and seal off the building and take the people at the party hostage. However, John McClane manages to escape and wants to stop them and or contact the authorities. This is a famous premise of one man's struggle against extreme odds and it's totally justified. It makes for a really smart story. The criminals arrive at Christmas Eve so it's believable they could easily take over one whole floor as no one else is working and they cut all the telephone lines making contact with the police very hard and so John McClane has to take them on alone but they are armed with machine guns and missile launches and there are 12 of them. But as they need to keep all the people hostage in the building is big it makes sense you can actually take them out one by one, so it involves a very menacing conflict that isn't totally unrealistic, although unlikely. And as John McClane is a trained cop whose wife is amongst the hostages, he has believable motivations for trying to take them down, and the stakes are high and it is an epic conflict. And not only are 30 people held hostage, but the criminals might just kill all of them. They really show the weight of the conflict and developed it, showing their fear and the uncertainty of what Hans will do. And you know, he's quite a twat. I mean, I'm always honest and just say I'm going to murder all of you painfully. I watched too many Hannibal films. Okay, that's a lie, I haven't seen any of them, yet they inspired me nonetheless. So here the plot really develops. The criminals' plan is really clever as well. They pretend to be terrorists as to hide the actual motives, but in reality they want to rob the vault with 660 million in it in bare bonds, but they need a security code and there are seven protection layers. So they question Joseph Takagi, however he won't give them the code, so they shoot him, making them even more menacing, and now they have to open the vault in time before the police manages to take them out. And this is a change from the novel Nothing Lasts Forever by Roderick Forb, which the film is based on, which I haven't read, but I know because I listened to the DVD commentary. In other words, I'm too lazy to read. Because in the novels they were actually terrorists, but this doesn't dump the film down at all, as using terrorism as a distraction is really smart and even original, not being actual terrorists or actual robbers, but just being robbers pretending to be terrorists, and as we are speaking of 660 million, this is a really epic robbery. And it is made even better by how difficult it will be to pull off, so there's tension on part of the villains as well. Also the plot is really thick and smart as McLean tries to activate the fire alarm to contact the police and uses a stolen walkie talkie while on the roof, but every time this tips off the terrorist as to where he is so he has to take them out. So he climbs through elevator shafts to find them and manages to take them out in pairs and take their weapons and Hans pretend pretends to the police everything is alright and from there two subplots are tied into the film that are just as heavy and make it even thicker. And the film perfectly manages to balance these, these subplots. It's a really thickly plotted action film. It's got a lot of detailed story twists, it's unpredictable, and it's also very original, tangible, and still very realistic and meaningful. And that is what puts this above all the regular action slog that is just average and mildly entertaining. McLean has to work together with the police, as when a cop shows up to check the emergency call, he throws a robber's body at his car, which is one of the coolest twists in any action film because he had no other way of contacting him as he couldn't hear him. So it's logical and the terrorists who were watching from afar see the covers blown so they start shooting at him when he already had a body crashing on his car so he rides off backwards and hysterically contacts the police and crashes his car. And of course he gets killed even though he was only two days away from retirement. What the nostalgia critic made one, the unusual suspect made one, I should get one also. It isn't family guy level so I'm still getting ahead. So now McLean is working together with a cop whose car he totaled and the police shows up while at the same time two of the criminals were brothers and one wants revenge for the other and the police actually in a very original twist try to attack and take the criminals out but their cops get shot at and the RV even gets blown up by a missile launcher which is also a really original twist. They can actually take on the police and are very good at defending themselves and the robber Hans controls the negotiations by demanding the release of political prisoners and then another heist film cliche is turned on its head as he claims they want helicopters 
not just to get off from the roof with the prisoners when in reality he's going to blow it up and pretend to be dead which it makes it easy for him to get away with all of the money as they will assume he's dead and is a way of using the hostages to make it seem as though everybody's dead as he'll kill them all in the process. It is also a really rewarding payoff to their obsession with the detonators John stole which they want back obsessively and even cooler as that when searching for McLean he leaves his gun behind and McLean finds him. The hero captures the villain but he pretends to be a hostage that's flat so they just have a talk but McLean is smart giving the man an unloaded gun so he reveals who he really is because of course he wasn't sure he was just checking. But his henchmen arrive and then we get another cool twist in that they shoot the glass around him to injure him so he's wounded. Nonetheless it all ends well cause SPOILERS! I hope the bum doesn't sue me for that by the way. He takes the vengeful criminals down and frees the hostages off the roof. And the reveal that they wanted the FBI to cut off all the power to the building so the vaults would open automatically is also really smart and satisfying. And really awesome was that John used a fire hose to jump off the building and quickly get to the 30th floor and that his wife is taken hostage but he's prepared for the cliche drop the gun or I will shoot the person you love situation as his machine gun is empty anyways so he uses duct tape to tie a gun behind his back and shoots Han and his henchmen by surprise. <laughs> I, I did this too to a woman once. Enter dollar. <laughs> why why aren't you laughing? What what's the difference with that? So the plot was really great, and it also has the perfect setting. The Nakatomi Plaza is a many-layered building with elevators and ventilation shafts to add to the cat and mouse game. Levels still in the construction add to the rough feeling. It is run by modern computers allowing the terrorists to seal it off completely and control it. And as it is very high, it makes for great tension. And you know what else is high? That guy that is hitting on Holly. You can see him using. What is the primary strength of the film also is that it's really dark and realistic for an action film. McLean gets injured, his friend gets killed, his new friend tells him he shot a kid, his wife is kidnapped. It really gives all this time to sink in. It is realistic incorporating the greed of the media, the politics of the police as well as the difficulties of pulling off a heist. But it also is a lot of fun. It has a really great sense of humor that serves to develop the characters and even to establish the story. Like in the opening where we see McLean as a relaxed open guy and he's thought he should make fists with his toes to help against air travel sickness as the guy has been doing it for nine years and it turns out it actually works when he tries it but the guy also sees his gun he, he tells him to relax as he's been a cop for 11 years where we learn he's a cop which is a crucial plot element later on and we see he can be warm. That's when he meets his limo driver and he asks him what he will do and he says he hasn't ever driven one before and he remarks he has never been a passenger in one before comforting him and we also see how he's self-hating and hot-headed as he didn't take on the many armed terrorists which would have been stupid as he was alone and would have been killed as well and he explains this to himself also being angry at himself for that. Bruce Willis performance really also adds to the comedy. He really gets the intensity and bipolarness across while also being dry when he has great catchphrases like this is what a TV dinner feels like and when he's called a cop Cowboy and remarks, yippee ki yay, motherfucker. Also, the humor helps contrast the more dark scenes, like in the opening when all Paul is buying snacks and they tackle the cliche of a policeman only eating donuts. As the guy at the counter remarks, he thought they only ate donuts, and him claiming it is for his wife, and then when it doesn't work for his pregnant wife. To be way more serious when he arrives at the conflict and learns how much in trouble McLean is. Ha, huh. humor to contrast the dark moments, like when you send people into the gas chamber. Okay, family guy made such a joke, yeah. I'm not mad at myself. I'm just disappointed. Hart Bochner as Harry Ellis is also a fantastic, funny and comedic character. He really gives a great performance, being totally over the top and sleazy and manipulative and totally awkward. And scenes like where they find him stiff and coke and he just quickly puts it away and where he's basically hitting on Holly in front of McLean are hilarious. And also that he thinks he can just get McLean to calm down by pretending that they're gonna kill him. But he reveals to them he's an important person McLean cares about, so they actually kill him. And when he realizes McLean hangs up, his face is just totally fantastic. And the film also contains a lot of swearing, but it fits the rough, blunt character of McLean and the dark situation, and it adds to the dark humor and only makes the film more entertaining. And also, it contains blood and violence, but it's not too over the top, and it only fits the rough action style. And aside from being very funny, the film is also, of course, incredibly entertaining as an action film, in which it got all the credit it deserved, because its action scenes are totally fantastic, but they also further the story. They're very well directed and edited, and they're very complex and action-packed, and logical to follow but they also really help further the narrative.